Conspiracy theories are most often a smokescreen to divert us from the true evil. My dad was right. This family's money is dirty. Imagination is far more fascinating than reality. Welcome to Working for Uncle Henry, the podcast. I'm the series author and your host, Angela Mullins. Well, art is another fascination of mine that I have given the Archer family, but Parker's perception is much less appreciative. Chapter 17. First thing the next morning, Parker guiltily approached Gerard. I'm afraid I made a bit of a mess in the garage last night, but I'll clean it up right after breakfast. Don't worry about that, Parker. It's all taken care of. I'm sorry. I had no intention of anyone cleaning up my mess. I was just upset. Never you mind about that now. My job is to take care of the family, and you're part of the family. Gerard smiled at him. Breakfast is served. Gerard served everyone's favorites, except Jennifer's. Instead of her usual smoothie and fruit, he set a tall glass of a greenish-brown sludge in front of her. Parker frowned at its unappetizing appearance. What is that? he asked. Looking as though she preferred to still be in bed, she stared at the drink and answered dryly. It's my happy juice Gerard makes me after I've had an eventful night. She took a sip and then another. It looks disgusting, Parker said with a grin finding it amusing that her eventful nights left her feeling so happy. Edith and Henry played their usual crossword puzzle game while Parker and Jennifer finished off their meals quietly. Spring was finally in the air and everyone headed outdoors except Henry, who disappeared to his study. Parker, having given up on the Flatlanders book, went back to H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, something light and entertaining. He took it out to the terrace to enjoy the morning air. He wasn't far into the book at all before he realized that while entertaining, it wasn't light reading. He had never given space and time much thought and wasn't sure he wanted to. It sounded complicated, like Jennifer's rhythmic breathing coming from several yards away where she twisted and turned into various complicated yoga poses. In between her inhales and exhales was the chirping of birds fluttering around in search of a place to call home for the season. Parker got up to stretch his legs and give his brain a break. The stone path from the terrace led first to the modest kitchen garden, then proceeded to beautifully arranged beds of daisies, primrose, bearded iris, roses, and ferns. While Henry enjoyed puttering around in the garden now and then, A professional gardener came around most mornings to keep it maintained. A stone pathway led to a clearing where Edith kept her easel and painted in the warm months. Several concrete benches were angled around in front of the easel where on occasion students and observers watched her work. Parker kept quiet, not wanting to interrupt her, although he was curious about what she was painting, especially after what Jennifer had told him. She wasn't copying a Van Gogh, Monet, or Picasso. This piece was nothing like the forgeries in the house. It seemed much simpler, just blocks of orange, white, and pink layered across the canvas, like something you'd find in a discount hobby shop or home decor store. Is this what she paints in her spare time? Parker frowned and strolled back to the terrace where Jennifer was rolling up her yoga mat. You were joking when you said Edith painted those copies all around the house, weren't you? Why would you think that? I was just watching her paint, he said, pointing toward the garden. No, all she's doing is painting big blocks of color across the canvas. Jennifer laughed. Probably uh, Rothko, then. Who? Mark Rothko, one of the most collectible post-war artists. His work isn't old enough to be public domain, so she has to get special permission to paint it. Rothko's paintings are about color and shapes and feelings. Passion. Some of his pieces have sold for 70 to 80 million dollars. Parker sighed in disbelief. And yet we still have people dying of hunger around the world. 
out working for Uncle Henry never requires me to understand art because I don't see that happening. Jennifer smiled. Well, as long as one of us does. She put her mat away in the pool house and challenged Parker to a game of billiards. Parker wasn't particularly interested in art, but for the sake of his job, he decided he should try to learn what he could. He started with one of Henry's books on the basics, mapping out the various periods of art history. At least that way, he could start with an area he found interesting. He observed Edith in her garden studio a few times, taking in her mannerisms and technique. That hadn't been helpful. Today, against his better judgment, Parker ventured to the local museum, where Mrs. Carpenter was curator. The exterior of the Rolling Rivers Gallery was 18th century neoclassical, but that was merely a facade. Inside, it possessed a cold and sterile atmosphere of beige marble floors and doorway arches, the walls painted a dull white, the normal museum design of a plain decor so as not to take away from the artwork. A sign directed Parker to a small Andy Warhol exhibit. He knew that name, at least, and was impressed the museum had something by someone so famous, until he saw the pieces. He stood in front of a painting of a large pink pig, frowned, and shook his head. Learning to appreciate art was going to be as difficult as he expected. The phrase, one man's trash is another man's treasure, came to mind. So it seemed to be with art and what was valuable and what was not. In many cases, all one had to do was die. Another art exhibit called Faces was a collection of self-portraits, some good, others equally bizarre. Did these people really see themselves this way? Parker's dad would say some of them must have been possessed and of the devil. An entire floor of the museum was named after the Archer family. Not Henry and Edith, but Samuel Archer, the man who was still a mystery to Parker. The family rarely talked about him. Parker vaguely remembered a frail old man from his early childhood. Then one day he heard his parents mumbling about his grandfather's death. Parker's mother was sad, naturally. He was her father but he didn't recall if she had attended the funeral. The museum was as quiet as a library, with only the occasional clicking of shoes across the hard floor and the white noise hum of the HVAC. Parker was accustomed to the quiet of libraries, but not so much the reverberant acoustics of this place. He was curious to see what was in the archer wing of the museum, but as he was about to ascend the stairs, he heard the soft echo of voices. One he recognized as Mrs. Carpenter, which made him back away. He didn't want to fight her off today. But then he heard the name Archer and positioned himself to see who the curator was talking to. He caught the other speaker's reflection in a mirrored object on display. Who was this tall, dark man discussing the archers with Mrs. Carpenter? Parker froze in his steps and listened for answers. I know the Archer family is committed to supporting the museum, but I would like to offer my support as well, the man said to a beaming Madeline Carpenter. We certainly welcome any and all support from admiring collectors like you, Mr. Zachary. Please call me Simon. He smiled and removed his wire-rimmed glasses, his blackish eyes peered into hers. After all, I expect we'll be getting to know each other very well. Mrs. Carpenter's shoulders bounced up in glee. What exactly do you have in mind? About the museum, of course. I want to sponsor an exhibit of World War II artifacts. Mrs. Carpenter fought hard to keep her smile from transforming to a frown. Oh, I'm sure you appreciate the role the war played in art history. Oh, yes, of course. A travesty it was. The Nazis took possession of many unique items I have access to some of them. It will be a one-of-a-kind exhibit. She perked up at the mention of one-of-a-kind exhibit. 
What do you need me to do? There are a few pieces here. He handed her a file folder. I hope you'll be able to help acquire. Perhaps Colonel Archer can be of assistance. Mrs. Carpenter flipped through the file folder. Parker wished he could see what was in it. What did Simon Zachary want Henry to find for him? Why not just approach Henry himself? But the most nagging question on Parker's mind was if Zachary really did murder Qatar, why hasn't Henry told the police? Why indeed? What exactly does Henry think Zachary is up to anyway? The two art exhibits described in this chapter are ones I viewed at the Jewel Collins Smith Museum while writing the book. My initial shallow impressions were perfect for Parker's character. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes for some fun stuff. And let me know what you think about the podcast in the comments. And if you're enjoying it, be sure to share it with a friend.